Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Brendan Ashworth. I'm the CTO of Bunting Labs. And today I'm going to share a lot of my learnings that I've had over the past nine months building and deploying AI models inside QGIS. Um, yeah. So a little bit about me. Um, just before I got into QGIS, uh, I studied machine learning at MIT. And then I also have an open source background. So I was actually involved in the Node.js project, um, which is an open source uh, approach to running JavaScript on the server. And I actually flew in yesterday from uh, San Francisco, but there was a small bug. Oh, actually, I don't have any slides. Thank you. There was a small bug flying. So it was a little bit unfortunate, but it was something that I had uh, been familiar with. Um, so I'm going to talk mainly about my learnings from this plugin. Has anyone actually had a chance to download this plugin? OK, a couple of people. Awesome. Um, but this is mainly not about the plugin. This is actually about what I've learned um, building specific AI models for QGIS and then deploying it inside QGIS. Um, it's actually gotten a little bit of a following. Um, people really seem to enjoy the plugin and also the promise of using these um, custom AI models inside QGIS. And so I wanted to share with you basically two main themes. Uh, first, what I've learned deploying AI models into QGIS. And then second, what I've learned from basically customizing QGIS to do what I want to enable these kind of new workflows. Um, yeah, so without another pause, Let's talk about deploying AI models. Um, so this is uh, the AI model that we first created. This is an AI vectorizer. And so what you're seeing on the screen is basically we take as input the prior uh, vector lines that you've digitized. And then based on the rasters that you have loaded in QGIS, we predict uh, all the future trajectories that could happen digitizing based on that context. Um, and so this is actually a neural network that we trained in-house um, to do this. And this is done entirely within QGIS. So you can actually go to the plugin installer, the plugin manager, and add this plugin. And this has been a really interesting journey. Um, this is one of the few AI models that was actually specifically designed for GIS and then deployed in QGIS, um, another great example would be Segment Anything. And to kind of give you some context as to how we did this, we actually created a custom architecture. So this is not a neural network that you can just download online. And we trained it in PyTorch uh, on NVIDIA GPUs with both, both raster geotiffs and shapefiles. And we basically taught the neural network to do this one thing, which is to understand the semantic meaning behind these rasters. Um, so when you present uh, a particular geotiff to this neural network, it actually starts pulling it apart. So it picks out different railroads. It picks out building outlines. It picks out um, perhaps road, uh, like dirt roads. Uh, and it develops an understanding of these things that are separated from other pixels in the image. And it's th this approach that allows us to actually uh, take a geotiff and then output a vector shape file. Um, and we did this by training on like uh, more than 150,000 different geometries. Um, and we knew that the neural network was actually doing something when we realized it started to generalize on new maps. This was actually really exciting for us. Um, early on, it would basically only work on maps that it had seen before during training. And once we realized that um, I think it was one day when we, draw, when we dragged in a satellite image, um, something that we hadn't really trained on much. And we realized it was actually really great at picking out the roads that we were onto something. But all of this kind of brings us into a dilemma. The neural network that we had to train in order to get this good performance was massive. Um, so we have more than 1.1 million parameters in the neural network. A parameter is just a number that you end up multiplying by some feature in that geotiff. Um, so we're taking these RGB pixel values. Um, even in radar, you can actually use this AI vectorizer like on synthetic aperture radar. 
um, we're actually multiplying all those values by these numbers. And that's difficult, because in user experience testing, the threshold for an instantaneous reaction is less than 200 milliseconds. And so running this neural network on the average user's machine takes about 20 times that. We're talking like 5 to 10 seconds. And that doesn't mention this other um, small, unfortunate thing, which is that running PyTorch takes about 2 gigabytes, which is like something maybe five times the QGIS download size. Um, so that's like just a non-starter. It's also good to keep in mind that the average QGIS uh, user computer might look something like this. And so we want to make sure that everyone can actually use this. And so we have this dilemma. We, what, do we, what are we able to do here? Um, well, we actually, the design architecture we ended up choosing was to do all of this uh, neural network inference, all this computation in the cloud. And so when you load a gigantic raster file, maybe they could be larger than a gigabyte, um, we actually split it up into chunks and then individually send these chunks to a server in order to do that compute and return it back to you. But we still face this issue of returning this response within 200 milliseconds. To fix that, we ended up creating a network of servers all over the globe. And so we have seven different data centers operating with our neural network. And when you use our plugin in QGIS, it actually automatically routes your requests to the nearest data center. And so we have three data centers in the Americas, two in Europe, one in Mumbai, and one in Sydney. And so building that neural network has been pretty difficult. But there's also the task of integrating this work within QGIS. Uh, QGIS, as all of you guys know, is this contributor-led open source repository. Um, and so it's really a matter of what the contributors want to add to QGIS than some sort of like enterprise-sponsored development pipeline. And so I'm going to show you a second AI model that we actually built within QGIS. And then I'm going to show you how integrating it within QGIS ended up being a little bit, a little bit more difficult than I expected. So this is our AI georeferencer. This is a second AI model we created. And this AI georeferencer will take in as input any, uh, any raster, any geotiff you give it. Or sorry, not, it's not georeferenced, so it's just a TIFF. Um, and it will automatically generate control points based on that image. And so this is also an interesting integration challenge. Um, but a little bit of background about the AI georeferencer. If you guys are not kind of familiar with the academic literature behind AI georeferencing, there's a couple of other models out there that exist that kind of uh, tackle this problem, but none of them are integrated into QGIS. And so, like, I'm a, you know, I'm a Q user myself. I want to access to these kinds of tools uh, in my existing workflow, but the existing academic literature are just kind of like privately held um, models to accomplish this. And so I was faced with this problem. How do I actually build an AI georeferencer inside QGIS, and how do I make it accessible? For a little bit of background, an AI, an AI georeferencer is actually a feature matching engine. And so a, if you were to take a look at these uh, various rasters uh, and to manually georeference them, you would actually semantically understand this image and then match these features to each other. So you might have a satellite base map, you might have OpenStreetMap open, and you might also have, this is our aerial imagery that we're trying to georeference. Mentally, for you, you would actually do this feature mapping yourself. And you would identify, okay, this road is actually the same, it's got the same curvature, we could maybe match the center line, and it's also got this, this tree that we can use. Even though these images may have been taken multiple years uh, and the vegetation has somewhat changed, let's assume that this tree can actually be used to generate a control point. And so once we have this um, AI model, 
And it's also important to note that this uh, approach, generating control points, is pretty much required in order to use this uh, professionally. Um, because if you have some standard of accuracy, you actually need to be able to go in and um, edit these control points yourself. So when they pop up in the georeferencer, you can go in and edit them. You can delete the wrong ones, and you can change the projection, change the um, rendering settings, you name it. And this is not something that you can actually just hop into like an LLM. Um, have, has anyone here used ChatGPT? Yeah, a lot of awesome. Um, this is pretty much not possible. Um, you need to basically connect to ground truth data sources in order to understand and georeference these images. And so let's look at what integrating this into QGIS looks like. So we've added a button inside the QGIS georeferencer, and you can just hit it and run the AI georeferencer. Now, does anyone know how to do this? Because I'll give you a hint. There's no API for adding a button to the toolbar in the QGIS georeferencer. I mentioned earlier that QGIS is an open source contributor-led uh, project. And if you go online to, actually, who has built a QGIS plugin? Awesome, nearly half of you guys. So if you guys have uh, originally learned how to build a QGIS plugin online, and you went to one of these tutorials, you might have this conception of what building a QGIS plugin looks like. Maybe you go into the QGIS build plugin builder, and it generates you the scaffolding for your plugin, and that's awesome. You can get right started. You can hit the plugin reloader and start going. And then you get a little bit more complex. So you might start using these PyQGIS APIs. Maybe you're calling into NumPy, GDAO. You're starting background tasks to do kind of larger processing. And maybe my least favorite, you're working with projections. But that's kind of where I want to introduce this uh, mental model of the iceberg of QGIS programming. Because these starter um, approaches don't quite get you to the more complex uh, tools, the more complex functionality that is within QGIS but may or may not be accessible. And so I want to introduce you to the bottom half of the QGIS programming uh, iceberg. At the top, we have uh, all the different QT APIs. These are actually designed for your use, um, so you should be using these. Uh, if you're using, if you want to access with third-party servers, you have to use the QT networking API. If you want to add uh, icons and toolbars and whatnot, you need access to the GUI. But what about everything that there's not an API for? What about the georeferencer? For that, we need to go and traverse the GUI. You see, in order to add this button to the QGIS uh, georeferencer, we actually enumerate every icon that exists in QGIS to find the move ground control point button. And once we find that ground control point button, I just add a plugin after it. And so even though there's not a way to just add this toolbar initially, because Qt gives us access to the entire GUI, we can go in and edit anything that we want. And then we can also go a little bit deeper. How do you actually add ground control points? So we've added the plugin, we've added the icon, that's great. Um, we always need like a GUI interface into our plugin. But how do we add ground control points? Fortunately, QGIS is written in C++. And it's built on top of PyQt and Qt, which is a graphics library. And that is built on top of SIP. It's, called, it's an acronym for SIP is Python, I think. And this is a um, layer that allows the Python and the, and the C++ to actually interact. Um, and so if you have access to the SIP, uh, if you have access to the SIP APIs, then you can call directly into the C++ API in QGIS. And this is also kind of called PyQt introspection. And that's actually what we do to add these ground control points. And so you can call directly into uh, C++ functions and uh, operate inside QGIS as if you were operating within that C++, within that core uh, QGIS repository. 
But this adds a whole other layer of complexity. So even though we have a lot of uh, control over where that, um, even though we have a lot more control over what we can do within QGIS, more power comes with more responsibility. And I will, uh, I'll admit it, I've crashed my computer a million times. It happens all the time. And that's as a result of taking these kind of more uh, advanced approaches. You see, C++ and all of the code within QGIS is not really ready for you to just go grabbing whatever APIs you want. And so what happens as a result is if you call these APIs with various objects, uh, you're basically passing it information into C++, and that's not really expected to be safe. And so basically when you run this, every once in a while, Q just crashes. And how do you, how do you deal with that? You actually need to use a program called LLDB and GDB. Has anyone used these before? I see a couple. I bet you guys are QGIS core developers. <laughs> um, and so these we can use to actually investigate all of the errors that we've accumulated by going deeper and deeper down the PyQGIS development iceberg. Uh, and so using this, we can identify all of the errors that we've added in these introspection and SIP layers. Um, additionally, when we pass these uh, APIs uh, objects, when we, when we pass this information, uh, it, there's no guarantee after we pass it that we can ever use it again. And so we have to consider these disposable. That's where uh, fighting the GC kind of comes in. The GC is a programming term for garbage collector. Um, and that's what actually deletes all of the items after we've used it. Uh, if there was no garbage collector in our computer, our computers would just run out of memory over time. And so that's more or less all of the things that I've learned about deploying AI models inside QGIS. And the motivation for sharing this is actually that I am hoping to see more and more neural networks and custom specialized AI models deployed in desktop applications like QGIS. Uh, QGIS has uh, an insane amount of functionality. It's one of the most feature complete applications that I've ever seen in my life. And the, in that complexity exist workflows that I hope can be improved on over time. Um, neural networks and AI are really here to stay. Uh, these are not just fads. Um, and so if we embrace kind of uh, using these more and more, uh, I hope and I hope that we can actually leverage this uh, to save time in our, in our own lives um, and in GIS as a whole. So thank you so much for listening. Um, that's pretty much my talk. And I'd love to field any questions that you guys have. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Quick question. Uh, actually, one of the beauties of QGIS and it being open source is that it's, the source is open and you can actually modify it and add features. So did you consider uh, adding a public API to the, um, um, to the georeferencer? Because the georeferencer was a plugin at least until a couple of years back and it was integrated into uh, the core part and it's uh, its its code is somewhere in between a plugin and the core so that's why it's not exposed um, uh, in python but uh, another an alternative option would be to actually modify the qgis code so that you can uh, expose parts of the api and not go into all this bottom of the iceberg uh, you did yeah no that's totally true um so the the georeferencer was originally a plugin and it was added in um, and because QGIS o is open source, I can basically go in and edit anything that I want. Um, this bottom of the iceberg, this like mental model that I've kind of created, is really to speed up my own development. Um, and so it's not so much that it is like the perfect solution here. Um, really the perfect solution here would be to add APIs, to document them as I go, and then uh, support them like going forward. Um, but one of the, uh, there's basically two issues that I, I've had personally with that. Uh, one of them is I can't actually compile it. 
on my computer because I have an M1, um, which is an, an issue that Key just, uh is generally fixing. Um, but the other one is actually backwards compatibility. Um, if we want our plugin to be accessible to versions before kind of the latest developer release, um, which most of our users are actually like kind of on 3.32 and 3.30, uh, we would basically have to create two um, compatibility layers, one with the API and one without. Um, and so that's like the correct solution, um, but this is kind of like the, the halfway point, I guess. Great question, though. Yeah. Next question. So your your plugin requires a data sent to to one of the, these servers worldwide and uh, processed and comes back. So we cannot use it offline, right? Not yet. Yeah, um, I think a, an offline version would be good, uh, but we don't currently have that. And yeah. do do I subscribe? Do I need to sub subscribe to a service that I can use it, or is there? I mean. How many requests am I allowed to use for free? Yeah, so we do have a free trial, basically. Um, and so you can use it the equivalent of, I think, four hours worth. Um, and that's totally free. Uh, beyond that, you can use it a little bit per day. And then we do have like a $19 a month subscription for it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? No? Oh, yes. Um, you, you briefly mentioned the um, newly released uh, segment anything engine. Um, how much did that um, throw you off course? <laughs> uh. Yeah, great question. Um, segment anything is like really good for some use cases. Um, I would say that if you are working with kind of aerial, uh, not aerial as in, um, if you're dealing with polygons in like satellite and aerial imagery, uh, drone imagery, um, segment anything, there's a good chance that it's faster at what you're doing. Um, but for a lot of our use cases, kind of like uh, specifically line string digitization, uh, we found that our plugin is a little bit better. Um, but it's like an awesome, yeah, awesome tool in GIS. Um, and it's also really great if you're consistently digitizing the same class of object where you can just kind of like describe it. Okay, I'm looking for um, rivers in this drone imagery. Uh, you can actually just type out rivers and it's um, really great at digitizing that. Yeah. A follow up question? Yeah. yeah. A short one. Sorry. Okay, then can I come back to you after? When, when we, yeah. Like, um, is it possible um, you, you, um, you, you, you have trained your model on, on recognizing uh, lines, but um, can you also recognize the text um, that is um, um, that is um, describing that line? So you have can you also recognize uh, river names, or you have uh, um, uh, plans for like five cables next to each other, and each cable has one uh, um, text describing what it is. Um, but um, you know they are all very close to each other, and, and can your engine um, um, match the right text with the right uh, line? Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, that's possible with segment anything, not currently possible with our neural network. Um, so that would kind of be another step of building. Um, but yeah, great question. Yeah. Thank you. I don't think we have time left for questions, so I would like to thank you for the talk. And thank you. And in the name of the organizers, we have something for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right. And thank you guys for listening.